As uh, Marion was telling you, I am a family physician. I still spend much of my week in an 8 by 10 room taking care of patients. And uh, a bunch of summers ago, I was asked by a colleague to come and fill in with her in this very sophisticated um, hospital in the Amazon in Peru off of a tributary of the Amazon River. And while I was there, uh, much like the story you just heard, I took care of a many fascinating problems that I don't normally see in my office in San Francisco. I saw machete wounds and snake bites and malaria, but I actually didn't see one instance of what really is my bread and butter in San Francisco, the diabetes, the hypertension, the cancers, the GI cancers, the heart disease, the inflammatory bowel. While I was working in this clinic, uh, my family, my husband and my two kids, were actually across the river in the village doing various activities and also playing soccer with um, the employees at an explorer's lodge that was upriver a little bit. And this was a picture that was taken our last day in Las Palmeras. The guy up front, the really healthy looking guy there, that's my husband who had a, a nice summer's rest. But what's really interesting about this picture are these two guys because in fact they are brothers. And if you look at them, they look very different. And you wonder why, and then when I tell you that the guy kneeling down, Jaime, never leaves this incredibly remote village. He works as a cleaner in the lodge and eats all local food from that village. And there's, you know, only accessible by boat and really by dugout canoe. So you're not getting a lot of the sodas and so on pumped in there yet. Whereas his brother, Miguel, is a guide and gets to go off to Iquitos for at least half of his time, which is the big city, and is eating from Iquitos. And what you see in this very much manifested in these two men is everything we've been talking about today. This modernization effect, this migration effect, which in fact it turns out you don't need to migrate at all in order to have it happen. And this fascinated me so much that I really started to learn more about it as a family doctor because in fact my patients come from all over the world and they suffer from this same thing once they hit San Francisco. And I'm not going to flood you with more of this data. This is looking at prevalence of diabetes in rural populations and then they're sort of ethnically equivalent, more urbanized populations. And we see how all forms of chronic disease just explode with modernization. So what is, what's going on in this package of modernization? Well, this is a food conference, so I guess you kind of guess that that's the punchline. But this study is an interesting one to look at what's going on because this is a study where they looked at a community living in western India and looked at their brothers and cousins who had migrated to Sandwell and poetically in the western UK. So I guess they, they're just a group of people who always prefer to go west, even when they go east. So... Um, so what's really interesting about this is that these communities, the Sandwell in the UK is about the population 300,000, Nafsari in India about 150,000. Nafsari is a little bit more rural, but is still fairly urbanized. So we're not talking pre-contact civilization here, right? So they looked at health parameters, and what they found was folks in the UK, their BMI on average was about 30 to 40 percent higher. They also, their blood pressures and their rate of heart attacks was 30 or 40 percent more. But then they started to look at risk factors and they realized that, in fact, the folks in Nafsari in India were smoking more and the folks in the UK were exercising more. So these two things that we like to blame as causes of modernization were, in fact, the opposite of what you'd expect in outcome. And what was really different between these two groups was the amount of calories that they were eating in the UK, which was roughly one-third more than those that they were eating in India. So this kind of um, discovery is really what catapulted me on my own 
armchair kind of science, which really was more ethnography of going around the world to various places that still had very low rates of chronic disease and trying to see what was in the diets there that could really be regained in this, from this nutrition transition. So it's a little bit of turning what we've just heard on its head and not focusing so much on all these terrible things like the sodas and the junk food and so on, but more trying to understand what did we leave behind that was protective. And um, um, uh, Dr. Carlson this morning definitely be, um, uh, spoke about this quite a bit. But I'm going to give you five ideas. And there are many, many more ideas, but I'm going to give you five ideas because I have a very limited amount of time of things that we left behind. And the first one that Dr. Carlson actually did touch on is this idea of lost medicine. Now, I spent time in Copper Canyon with a group uh, called the Tarahumara, and I did not, I don't want to give you the false impression that I was hanging with the Tarahumara, because in fact, what has kept them so healthy is that they really, in many ways, are kind of a pre-contact tribe. I mean, they'll be polite with you on the trail and so on, but there are very few anthropologists or sociologists who've actually managed to infiltrate their ranks, and they have very little to do with the cultural uh, norms within larger Mexico. They don't pay, ta pay taxes. They live in very remote, remote areas. They walk great distances. They've kept their own language, their own rituals, uh, and their own diet. And uh, what's so interesting about them is that genetically they are cousins of the Pima Indian of Arizona, and yet when you look at the rates of diabetes amongst Tarahumara, it's even lower than what's listed here. Those are Mexican Pima who are up more on the, in the Creel, on the canyon borders. But when they, the researchers go deep into the canyon, they find virtually no no diabetes, versus the U.S. Pima, as you know, by the time you're 35, 40, you have about a 40% chance of developing diabetes. So we know this genetic similarity, it's not genes that are causing the, this incredibly high rate with the Pima or low rate with the Tarahumara. And as I was wandering around Copper Canyon, and as I said, doing my work more from a distance, because I certainly was not even welcome into any homes there, this is what I saw in your typical Tarahumaran home. What do you see growing out front there? No palace. Is there, is, do we, we have botanists in the room. Does anybody know what one of the most active ingredients in nopales does? It decreases insulin resistance. It actually helps your liver metabolize glucose. It actually works very much like metformin or glucophage for you physicians in the room, which is a medicine we use for diabetes. And in fact, when botanists and ethnobotanists from the University of Mexico went down into the canyon area and started sampling uh, vegetation that was growing there, they found over 300 species of herbs and, and, and different foodstuffs growing there that have hypoglycemic effects. So when we think of people emigrating to the U.S. and getting destroyed by our junk food and our McDonald's, yes, that is part of the story. But the other part of the story is what have they left behind? What powerful protective medicine did they leave behind? And you see this as you travel around the world. Here, I was in Iceland, and now in Reykjavik, incredibly high rates of heart disease, diabetes, depression, what have you. But you go out to the rural areas, it's quite rare. This is what grows everywhere there. These are bilberries, which are omega-3 bombs. They're basically rich in antioxidants. And this is something that you get traditionally within your diet there. In Crete, here I am hunting for Horta with Caterina. Once again, this protective food that you leave behind when you move to a city like Athens, which um, lowers rates of heart disease and so on. The Horta are the wild greens. And here in souk in Morocco, another culture that's now being assailed with heart disease. I mean, it's amazing to see what's happened in North Africa. I lived there for many years as a child. And I go back now, and everybody's dying at 30 and 40 from heart attacks. And this is one of the things they're leaving behind, is this anticoagulative effect, anti-inflammatory effect. I mean, if anybody has arthritis in the room, you should be chowing on this stuff. So the second idea is this idea of lost dietary diversity. 
Now, Crete is famous as being a place that has had, at least during the seven country study, when Ansel Keys was doing his work, having very low rates of heart disease. So all these researchers converged on Crete to find out what was the superfood, what was the magic food that was protecting the people of Crete. And one of the most famous researchers to do this was a woman named Antonia Tricopoulou, who published in the New England Journal of Medicine and so on. And she wanted to find that magical food on Crete. So she actually took the Greek Mediterranean diet and codified it and gave all these different foods sort of risk qualities and looked at the odds ratio for death for all these different parts of the Mediterranean diet. And her hypothesis was, of course, meat is going to come off the scale in the positive greater than one because it's dangerous and sugars and so on versus things like vegetables will be way, you know, 0.5, what have you. They're going to decrease risk of death by a half. What she found, if you look over on that right, far right column, what do you see in the hazard ratio for death there, those numbers? They're kind of all around one. I mean, meat's a little more than one. Sweet's a 1.01. So what's the answer here? What's the magic food on Crete? This is the answer. It's this incredible diversity in the diet. It's the recipes. It's the food combinations. You know, if I want to get become a nutrition geek, I can say it's the olive oil bringing out the lycopene in the potato in the tomatoes or the lemon that's increasing the iron absorption from the spinach and go on and on like that. But really, who cares? You know, it's this incredible combination that happens. Go to Mexico and you'll find the same thing. What do all these nutritionists tell you right now? Oh, you have diabetes? Avoid carbohydrates. That's the you know everybody's on a no carb diet these days. You look at the Tarahumara who don't have diabetes and all they eat are carbs. And in fact, they eat some kinds of carbohydrates that you might think are somewhat more high glycemic, like corn, even the ZMAs, the more primitive forms of corn, are slightly higher. They, they distribute sugar quicker into your bloodstream. But you look at how these foods are combined, and re the research shows that, in fact, one of these whole grain tortillas, the glycemic load slows down to match that of the beans, which have a very low glycemic load when you mix them together. So this idea of food combination, add some cilantro in there, and you're getting even more impact. So these diets are very powerful. This third idea is an, the idea of lost fats. Now, you know that research that I told you about, about the Nafsaris versus the folks from Sanwell, remember that? Well, one of the things they found was the folks from Sanwell were eating significantly more fat in their diet. And that's important to understand because like, if you go to a place like the highlands of Crete or Copper Canyon, this is the industrial revolution there, okay? This is as fancy as it gets in terms of being able to process your fats. So what does that mean? if this is how you make your oils. You're not going to eat that many, much of them, right? You guys are sleepy, I know. I'm just trying to get you to wake up a little. Right? You're not going to eat, you know, you're not getting the gallons of mazola corn oil that you get when you live up on the, the, edge, the edge of the, um, in Creel, which are the more urbanized areas in Copper Canyon. So yes, you are getting less fats, but what's the other thing that's happening? Any ideas? Speak up. You're working for it. You're working for it. And it also turns out that when you're getting your fats from whole foods or from foods that can be easily processed with a matate or a ground stone, that the profile of those fats is in fact healthier. Those tend to be the polyunsaturated fats. The ones that you tend to get from more, remember that processing we saw of that palm oil earlier? Well, you take palm fruit oil, which is very high in polyunsaturated fats, and you do that other horrible thing to it that we saw where you convert it to that chunk of white. Well, then all of a sudden, you're getting horrible saturated fats. So you need the industrial revolution in many cases to give you those unhealthy fats. And this is the other ticket. This, these guys, you're not going to eat them three times a day for $1.99 a pound. Okay, this is a savings account. You're going to wait for a wedding or a funeral or until you're named chief of the village in order to sacrifice one of these. And otherwise, you're going to use them for what their best purpose is, which is what? Milk, Milk and 
agriculture. They're there to regenerate the fertilizer back into the land and help you grow more food. And this just shows you what happens when you have grain-fed beef versus the more wild foods that, that Leah is working on. You get a much better profile of omega-3 fats and polyunsaturated fats and much less saturated fat. Look at that grain-fed beef. It's quite amazing if you look at how many um, uh, grams of saturated fat you're getting in, in that. So the fourth thing, and we've been talking about this all day, is this idea of lost microbial diversity. And uh, this is very important. When I, I worked in West Africa for Save the Children for a while, and I started to collect words for fermented foods just in the zone where I was working, you know, Nigeria, Cameroon. I mean, it's amazing. And this, this is just a partial list. It goes on and on and on. You go to any culture in the world, they have so many different kinds of fermented foods because that's how we preserved foods forever. What are fermented foods? Does any, has anybody here ever fermented? Yeah, so what, what are the bacteria from fermented foods? Where do they come from? They come from soil. They live on the vegetable, and the, those are the ones who are actively doing the fermentation. And when researchers have gone and looked at the microbiome of children who are living in remote areas that are almost pre-contact, like in Burkina Faso in the town of Bulpan, where they're still, in the, by the way, these are healthy children, unlike the Malawians. They actually are getting a good uh, meal. They've been examined by pediatricians before the study. This, these were Italian researchers. And they compared them to kids in Florence who are eating basically McDonald's. What they found was that the Burkina Faso kids had many more Bacteroidetes type bacteria in their gut and that these are really important for processing whole grains and vegetables. They also had types of bacteria that the kids in, in Florence didn't even have at all. And those were types of bacteria that looked awfully like bacteria from the Soil. soil, yes. So it turns out that, in fact, we are not closed systems. And the research is coming in more and more that the places where our food is grown actually interacts with our microbiome, which then interacts with our DNA. And so this diversity of foods that are fermented that have bacteria from the soil impact our health. And... We see this all over the world. They're studying children who are raised in these traditional farms in Bavaria that have no allergies and asthma. And once again, what are they finding when they're culturing these children in their mattresses and everything? Bacteria from the... Yes, you guys get it. And this is research that was just published in the World Allergy Journal, and they've shown that as biodiversity is going down on the planet, Allergy and asthma and probably every disease we've talked about today is going up. So focusing on the junk food is important, but we have to look at the substrate in which we are all living. And I am seeing children with exploding rates of caries in my practice in San Francisco whose mothers are feeding them everything healthy under the sun that they can think of. And we're really seeing it going up in various places. So very important what's happening there, but this is, this is a shared environment, and we really need to start to think about this in a much larger way. The final thing is lost eating traditions. Can you see here in this picture doesn't look like the rest of the team? <laughs> um, so I had the weirdest job a couple summers after I was in Peru. I was hired by Chubu Hospital in Okinawa, Japan to go to Okinawa and spend the summer teaching medical students nutrition. Okay, This is the land of the long-lived people where people live to over 100 and it's documented on birth certificates. And they wanted some weird Jewish lady from San Francisco to fly out there and talk to them about healthy foods, you know? It was bizarre. So here I am, and I'm on this team called the Metabolic Syndrome Team because it's a new disease that they'd never heard of. And, and they were starting to try and figure out how to treat it in the hospital. Metabolic syndrome, my bread and butter, that's all we see, we doctors, is metabolic syndrome. And there I was working 
on this team, and every morning I was getting up and eating my breakfast, and this was the pack of the post um, cereal box that I was eating from. And does anybody read Japanese here in the room? Well, I didn't read Japanese, so it took me weeks to figure out what this package said. And I'd stare at it every morning, and I finally ran into the hospital with it and asked one of my colleagues. And he, he said, the message says, don't eat this. Eat this. This has 12.9 grams of fiber in it, and it is much better for your health. Okay, so there's white rice in that picture instead of brown rice. But otherwise, come on, guys. The diversity of the diet here and the tradition of a complex breakfast with all these different types of nutrients. And now the research is, ca is catching up with it, and we know that people that do have a real meal for breakfast, in fact, are losing weight more. And this is a study that just came out of Spain that breakfast and having that kind of traditional breakfast is so important for our health. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, this is dinner that was being cooked by Fujiko-san, who was the mother of one of the ER docs I was working with. Can anybody guess how many people she was cooking for here? Take a guess. Ten. Oh, you guys are so smart. There we are. Once again, who does not quite look like the others? But this captures so much, okay? This picture, and that's Kenji all the way on the right, who's my colleague and who just thought that I was completely, I mean, I kept on taking pictures of this family meal, but what are the traditions here that we can all learn from? Small portions, Small portions variety. Eating together. Eating together. <laughs> yes, this is a family who actually, if I hadn't been there, would have said some kind of prayer, some kind of... Uh, and then we did do that. Some, they paused. They did something for the food. It turns out when you spend time before you start eating, you actually release leptin, which makes you stop eating. You release some ghrelin, too. But just, just um, contemplating your food will make you eat less. They also practice something in Japan called harahachibu, which is just a rule they all have, which is eat until you are eight parts full. Don't stuff yourself. So this kind of lost tradition. This is Nectario on Crete who is cleaning his snails for Lent. It turns out that if you're practicing the Greek Orthodox religion, there's about 180 days a year where you're on modified fast and not eating decadent foods. And the researchers once again have found that that's another food tradition that translates into lower lipids year-round and lower body mass index. So in conclusion, what can be regained by all these things that I've just asked you? And this is more for our conversation together. Um, but we need to rediscover our pharmacies. They're sitting there right under our noses on Mission Street, on San Paolo Avenue. You know, and they're not terribly expensive. We need to discover these kinds of foods from whatever culture we're from. Last two weeks ago, I was at Yale giving grand rounds in the Department of Psychiatry, and they said, come on, we've got to show you this. They are trying to stop prescribing antipsychotics to their patients in the community mental health program, and instead they're trying to figure out how gardening and connecting them to foodstuffs is going to actually help with this epidemic of me you know, mental illness that they're having. And there's, the preliminary results are, in fact, very promising. And so, in terms of adding to those seeds, we need to start to think of these as clinical interventions. This is, my son went to Willard Middle School, which does not have the same resources as King in terms of the edible schoolyard, but these are children get, getting uh, reconnected to their medicines. And this is Clean Green Farms, where I spent some time in Washington State, which is really there to grow foods for the African-American community in Seattle that are foods that, in fact, they want to eat because maybe mescaline salad is not their medicine. And so we need to start to bring it back to healthy soil and think about what are those healthy uh, foods. And this is Venice and her grandson. Along with that, we need to rediscover our recipes. And La Cocina in San Francisco is really an amazing kitchen incubator that's starting to try and preserve these teaching, cooking in various forms. This picture, I'd spend a week interning in the Bronx, and what's going on in this 
in this um, conversation are two women who are exchanging recipes, one from Honduras and one from South Carolina. And they are both uh, work in the community gardens there, and they both talk to the young mothers who come. This is the kind of change that we need. Here's a young woman in New Haven at the farmer's market, but like the one Preston Marion showed, who's teaching recipes. And finally, we need to discover our food traditions, whatever they may be, and the family meal. And in closing, I've just got to tell you this story. I was in La City in the highlands um, of Crete, and I was trudging along while I was doing my work, and I was trying to find some elderly folks to talk to about their indigenous diet. And this woman ro rode up on a donkey, and she asked me what I was doing. She looked a little concerned. And I told her, and she said, well, I'm in my late 80s. You should talk to me. And so I started to ask her questions as she was sitting there on her donkey. And finally, she, she just she said, wait a sec. You know, you look terrible. Get on. <laughs> and she walked me back to my hotel that way. So whatever she has, I want, because that was one of the most humiliating moments of my life in my 40s to be walked back to a hotel by a woman in her 80s and me riding on the donkey. So thank you very much.